Good morning, and I call this hearing of the Senate Communications and Technology Committee to order. I would like to welcome everyone this morning, and today is the final part in our series of hearings on the consolidation of our state agency IT systems. And we will be discussing Senate Bill 482, sponsored by myself and Senator Ament, and again, Senate Bill 482 would consolidate the administration and management of the Commonwealth's information technology under the new Office of Information Technology. It would require each agency's chief IT employee and other associated staff to work under the office in their respective agency. And they would answer to the director who serves as the Commonwealth's chief information technology officer. In addition, this bill would also strengthen the Commonwealth's cybersecurity capabilities and uh, it would require all state agencies to adopt new cybersecurity standards created by the director, which must match industry best practices. We are living in a time where cybercrime is one of the biggest threats to our way of life, and we have seen time and time again, most recently with the Department of Health's COVID-19 contact tracing data breach, how easy it is for personal information to fall into the wrong hands, and the state handles incredibly personal, sensitive information from all of our constituents, and it is incumbent on us to keep it safe. Essentially, the goal of this legislation is to reduce costs, saving taxpayers dollars, ensuring that projects are completed on time and on budget, and that our cybersecurity is as strong as it possibly can be. And last week, we heard from other states on how they operate their IT consolidation. And today, we plan on hearing testimony from the experts in our state on how it is currently done and their thoughts on the proposed legislation. And I would now like to turn it over to Chairman Kane for some opening remarks. Chairman Kane. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to keep my remarks pretty brief. So we're here today for the second of two hearings on Senate Bill 482, the proposed IT consolidation bill. Today we'll be hearing from the Office of Administration and Department of General Services, the two state entities currently responsible for the IT operations, management, services, and procurement that would be transferred to the Office of Information Technology under the bill. I'm sure today's testimony will be valuable to this committee. In particular, I'm looking forward to hearing from the Office Administration. Pennsylvania Office of Administration has been nominated for and received several awards from NASIO for their work on IT consolidation and cybersecurity. Even with a large nationwide organization, their work on behalf of Pennsylvania has stood out, and I look forward to hearing their critical perspectives. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chairman Kane. And uh, we'd like to kick things off today with our first panel. Uh, joining us today is John McMillan, Chief Information Officer in the Office of Administration. And we will begin with swearing in CIO McMillan. If you would, Mr. McMillan, please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Uh, that would be great. Yes, thank you. Do you swear that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, please affirm by saying yes. Thank you. Um, as we have written testimonies, Mr. McMillan, I would uh, ask you to please make some brief opening remarks, um, and then we'll open things up to the panel for, for questions. Thank you. You, you can proceed with, with your comments. Thank you so much, and for the opportunity to appear. Senator Phillips Hill, Senator Kane, and all um, the members of the committee. Mr. McMillan, if you could turn on your microphone. It's, yes, there should be a green light on it. It's on. Okay, pull, if you could pull it a little closer. I don't think it's being picked up. There we go. Better? Thank you. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to appear, Senator Phillips Hill, Senator Kane, and all the members. I'm John McMillan. I am the Chief Information Officer and um, very proud of the work that we've accomplished in the, the Office of Administration, certainly in my tenure. I'm sure you've had an opportunity to read the written testimony. Um, I believe it provides some insight into kind of where we're at, um, given what we're intending to accomplish with the bill. And I'm also sure you've had an opportunity to think through some of the insights that national experts provided last week about the different operating models under which state government IT throughout the nation are, 
are organized. I, I think really the lesson from that is what's best for Pennsylvania. Whether it's a, an executive order or a law, uh, I think as Mr. Robinson from Nacio said, when you've seen one state, you've seen one state. Before I answer any questions, I, I'd just like to focus on a couple of things. And, and what you'll hear a lot from me this morning is about money. But I, I'd, I'd like to focus on the people side of the business. We, we talk a lot about technology, but to a degree, the information technology business is not really about technology. It's about people. It's about the people needed to manage the technology. And I want to make sure that as we uh, go through this morning's discussion, we're bringing the people side of it into the conversation. The idea that the Commonwealth has struggled to keep information technology costs under control and to begin to reduce information technology costs is a key element of, of the bill. The, the fact of the matter is, and from our perspective, is that our spending has remained flat for three consecutive fiscal years. I, th I think we've done a reasonable job managing the successful implementation and management of systems given the resources that we've have. Um, and I believe that we have avoided, some could say reduced, the need for an additional $120 million of funding. During prior testimonies, we believe that we have described the path of IT consolidation that we've been on for many years. And I would say over two decades. The shared services transformation undertaken in this administration is the latest step on our progression to continued consolidation, optimization, and transformation, delivering improved results for the agencies we serve who serve the Pennsylvanians in this state. It is part of our continual process and it has been in place since the office began. While we may not agree on all the particulars, I can agree with you that we must do better. We want to do better. And I think the results that we have achieved over the last few years demonstrate that we're on the right track. Questions, please. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Um, if I could, last week we heard testimony from the Chief Information Officer from the State of Utah. And he mentioned that his office is in constant coordination with all other agencies and that this was especially evident during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, his office sat at a table with the Secretary of Health and the Governor to formulate a strategy for how the state would implement their new COVID policies. So my question to you is, does your office routinely meet with other departments to coordinate any IT efforts? Thank you for the question. Yes. Um, today we are organized in what we call delivery groups or delivery centers. And the design of these groups is meant to work with agencies under uh, the cabinet. And the, on a daily basis, we are working with agencies across the Commonwealth and several independents. In the specifics, what we did during the pandemic was we allowed um, skilled IT resources to address the demands of the pandemic that we had no idea prior to the start that we were going to face. And so when we were talking about very specific agencies like the Department of Health, we're there every day. We have lots of people involved in solving the business problems of the moment. We evaluate what the ideas are to provide a number of solutions. And we work with them, I believe, effectively to deliver automated services to serve Pennsylvanians. So um, as a follow-up to that question, at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, did your office ever meet with the Department of Health to discuss the strategy for how the state would handle its contact tracing efforts? Uh, yes, we did. And was that for the initial contract with the first vendor for contact tracing, or was that after the data breach for the second contract? Um, 
So w again, we're, we're part of the day-to-day -day operations of the department. We're aware of what problems they're trying to solve. So you took part uh, with the department and advised them when they put out the RFP for that first contract for I, the I, Insight Global contact tracing vendor. I think the sequencing of events I'm not completely clear on. Um, it's pretty simple. It's a yes or no answer. So just, just trying to get some insight and understanding. Did your department, did Office of Administration, uh, work with the Department of Health to discuss the strategy for how the state would handle its contact tracing efforts, specifically with regard to the Insight Global contract? I, I believe the answer is no, not for the initial one. Very good. Thank you. Uh, would like to uh, now recognize Senator Dush for questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McMillan, thanks for your testimony, and uh, I appreciate the written testimony. A couple of things, uh, on page one you had uh, reviewing str uh, strategic projects over certain thresholds. What are the thresholds? Um, I, I believe it's $250,000, sir. So I, any, I would need to double check the IT policy for that. I believe it's two fifty. Okay. Uh, would it also include uh, with third party access to systems and that sort of thing? Any scope in that? Above that threshold that is something threshold. that will be considered, yes. Thank you. Um, you say on page 2, OA began to consolidate technology, infrastructure, functions, and services through the creation of a managed services relationship with an external supplier to maintain the mission-critical mainframe and server environments for multiple agencies. Uh, so this is a third-party provider, is that correct? Yes, sir. And do they uh, maintain the uh, private information, uh, personally identifiable information as part of those systems? In accordance with the laws, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, further down in page two, uh, you say with a portfolio of over 2,000 business applications, varying processes and multiple uh, tools and contracts to optimize the full benefits of the model, uh, we'll continue to realize some benefits. All right. Uh, the question I have is uh, 2,000 business suites. That's an awful lot of business suites to uh, provide security for. Uh, are, uh, how do you go about doing that process? Or uh, do you have adequate people to make sure that those business applications are secure? A couple of questions there. So let me first start with the, the size of the portfolio is an indication of how Commonwealth agencies rely on automation to deliver services to citizens. The fact that this portfolio has grown over 60 plus years is a key thing that we are trying to improve. And it's one of the biggest risks on our day-to-day -day delivery of services. Not, not because there are security risks or compliance risks or regulatory issues. Part of it is, again, about the people in order yes. to manage these systems and these applications, right? Some of these systems were put in place uh, a long time ago, and some of the technology has evolved. Uh, as we look to recruit and develop our skills, sometimes there are gaps in, I'm just gonna say education. So for example, let's say a system was developed in COBOL on IMS many, many years ago, and so some schools today are not teaching that as a contemporary technology. So as a service provider, we're managing the risk of supporting a system while we are trying to improve other systems. It's analogous to painting an airplane while it's in the sky. So the second piece is we have established a, a layered security model to help protect those systems. Think of it a little bit like traveling on airlines today. I'm gonna kind of stick with that idea. Right? When you think about what that travel experience is like, one of the first things you have to do is present a credential. And if we consider you as a passenger like sensitive data, we want to make sure that that gets to the right place as securely as possible. So I'm sure you remember, say, 20 years ago, maybe longer, that kind of control around travel was very, very different. So what we've done with our layered model is tried to make sure that wherever there is 
a perceived vulnerability or risk that we have a way of determining what those risks are and how we can prevent them from getting any deeper into the layered model. I hope that makes sense to you. It does. Uh, it's kind of like the de defense in depth uh, concept that the military uses for defending aircraft and facilities. But uh, with the legacy systems, the are you setting up a sort of like a perimeter defense where before they can even get into those old legacy systems, they have to be pre-screened before they can get into them? Yes, sir. Firewalls, intrusion detection, that's all part of the layered model. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my last bit of questioning has to do with, uh, on page five, you were talking about Act 77 of 2019, uh, which went into the... Uh, uh, very concerned with the way uh, the information is held and given what happened with the tracking of uh, the, the Insight Global issues, the third party access to the voting sure system, uh, were you party to that discussion and uh, what sort of things uh, were discussed and what kind of protections are in place? Ter ter terrific question. Um, so first, the, the point in the testimony about Act 77 is really not about voting. It's about our ability to assign and reassign people from active projects to new projects based upon demand. So for example, if a law like Act 77 passed and it was time driven for implementation, what we want to do as a central provider is to make sure that we're meeting the highest demands. And through good decision making, what we call governance, we're working with all the agencies we serve so that, oops, apologize, so that skills are applied to solve the problem as quickly as possible. In terms of the modernization of the voter registration system, the Office of Administration is involved on a day to day basis with the Department of State. And what we're attempting to do in modernizing voter registration for Pennsylvanians. So you're involved with the new SURE system that they're talking about uh, getting in place, is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, what is the role, uh, as you understand it, uh, as this develops, of third-party access, uh, where certain groups would be available to, or permitted to help input driver's licenses, last for Social Security, et cetera, to get voters registered through that SURE system? I'm not familiar with all the details of the data elements, but the idea of voting, uh, registering to vote uh, on technology as it exists today has to be modernized. We spend a lot of money to keep that uh, functioning. There's some um, network technology that allows uh, counties to connect in a secure way to that central system, and we're really um, seeking to modernize it, including things like spatial um, uh, visibility, geospatial, um, uh, to voting districts, a, a lot of things that the current system just is not capable of. So when it, when it comes to protecting it, um, we're going to follow a very similar path. Um, but really what the department is trying to do is to take an existing system and adopt the way it does business to that system. We're really not modernizing the current system. It's essentially a replacement. I hope I answered your question. The, and you've given me some insight, but the, the question I'm trying to get to is, uh, you brought up the, the greatest vulnerability is actually people. Uh, and given that fact, uh, is the department actively seeking guidance from you on how to ensure that the people who are given access to those machines for the purposes of inputting data have been properly vetted and that the, uh, the system before, are there things put in place ahead of time to ensure that uh, we're not allowing basically voters to be created uh, or where, for instance, you may have a legal resident that has the ability to vote. If somebody had access to their driver's license and the last four of their social security number, the individual that would be legally allowed to vote could be legal, could be registered and voted without having known that they've been registered and voted. 
and I want to try and keep uh, find out if there are things being put in place to prevent that from happening. I believe that that's part of the, the project, sir. Thank you for clarifying your question. Yeah, I'd like to uh, get some information on how that is being applied. Be Thank happy you. to follow up with you on that. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Senator Dash. Senator Kane. Good morning, CIO McMillan. Good to see you. Uh, could you please tell the committee about the work OA has done to earn awards and nominations from NASIO and what awards and national recognition OA has received? Um, Senator, some of that's in the testimony. Okay. There's a list of about 28 awards that we've won over the last uh, six plus years. Okay. Um, and I'd, I'd like just to clarify that these awards although they are information technology awards frequently from the national association of state cios they're really awards for business systems as we look to that portfolio of 2000 applications and we work with the agencies that we serve there is national recognition of what we're accomplishing so i i, I could give you some examples clearly one of them is for the consolidation work that that we did in 2017. Just give me a second to get there in the testimony. Um, and I'm optimistic that there's some good news coming about some of the most recent submissions. Um, so uh, last year, um, the OA team worked with the Department of Transportation to establish a, a data analytics solution to help their maintenance organization deliver better services internally. And we won a national award for that. Again, not the Office of Administration. The Department of Transportation and their business users won the award for the automation and the application of the technology in this data analytics space against submissions from 54 states and territories. Great, thank you. We do this on an annual basis. We also work with the Center for Digital Government to demonstrate a progression towards improving digital in interactions with citizens and businesses across the state. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for the question. With respect to Pennsylvania, how does our cybersecurity compare to other state governments, and in particular, Michigan and Utah, that testified before the committee last week? Um, good question. How would I compare? I'm very sensitive in talking about cybersecurity. I, I think that we do a terrific job. Uh, and I apologize for Eric Avakian not being here. He's um, enjoying some well-earned time with his family. And Eric is our chief information security officer. We have taken a, a national standards-based approach for implementing our layered model. We use NICE, we use NIST, all international, uh, um, sorry, uh, national standards for the application of technology to protect information, which is a little different than privacy, just so I'm, I'm clear, right? Privacy is about, partially about conforming with the law to protect v various types of data, and information security is about the application to do those kinds of things, whether it's regulatory, uh, controls like HIPAA or FTI and so on. So when, when I look at what we've done and the volume of uh, attempts to get through our layers, I would say that we've done an outstanding job. We're not perfect. We can do better, no doubt. Very good. Thank okay? you. And I've got one more question before. All right. So during the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, did you have to shift resources from projects and operations to pandemic needs? Yes, sir. Um, I, I don't have the exact number of projects, but it's between 15 and 20 that did not exist on March 16th. And between March 16th and I'm gonna say roughly September of last year, we developed 15 to 20 brand new systems from scratch that were not on our active project list on March 15th. Okay. So things like the PPE portal, things like um, vaccination rates, 
all spatially enabled. All of these things were completely off the radar. And so based on the existing governance structures that we have, we're able to help everybody understand that we might need to pause an active project and bring staff off that project to meet those new project demands. There are, there are several projects that we accomplished, all again intended to support agencies like DGS to deliver their services. Um, and when, when we think about what we've accomplished, I don't think that we could have got it done without shared services in place. It gave us the, the, stru the structures, the right people at the table, talking about what the demands were, understanding that our supply of labor, people, is constrained. It's partially constrained by our budget. It's also partially constrained by our ability to fill key slots. Not that there's a huge risk there, but it's an ongoing requirement for us to flex our staff to meet those demands. Sometimes we don't know about them, right? right? Yep. There, there's a new law over the hill. Th there's a new business situation over the hill. There's a merger in the industry that causes us to rethink what technology we already implemented and operate, and it might not be available in the future. We're, we're doing this all the time. And if I could go just a little further, one of the key elements that we struggle with, right, and, and I, again, IT is a people business, right? We want to make sure that we're recruiting our teams, developing them, and spending the appropriate amount on personnel. But every time our personnel costs increase, one of the things that we have to do is optimize our operational costs. And we've been doing that for many years. And if I could try to put it in numbers for you, right? Our central IT services are about $232 million on an ongoing basis. About 75% of that is for people, which means every time that people costs increase, we have to find a way of reducing and controlling and managing central IT costs so that we don't have to pass those costs on to our customers. And from our perspective, those are cabinet level agencies, which means if our costs go up, that means they're not able to deliver a program or part of a program. That's not our intent. Our intent is to run IT services as a business. And to do, just to piggyback off of that, would, and this is your opinion, would Senate Bill 482 make these adjustments easier or harder? Complicated question. I understand the intent of the bill. I think to a degree it would hamstring us more than necessary. I think we have demonstrated over the last few years that we're able to move with the market, move with demand, given the structures that are in place. I'm not sure I can agree one way or the other, but I believe that there is some risk in the bill. I think that's the best way to put it, right? The bill drives, to a degree, demand for new money. And we've operated within our budgets for several years. If you, if you do the math there, the estimate is around 10%. We have to find a way of optimizing what we do today 10% less to accommodate what we believe are new requirements. I don't, I, I want to be clear. The requirements are good requirements, right? Visibility, transparency, all on board with that. We just need to find a way to balance it. G given the fact that shared services is an augmented service, we really don't have any other way of paying for what needs to be done. Again, not that it's wrong, right? But to pass those costs to agencies. That's the risk. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Kane. Uh, if I could piggyback off of that, uh, you mentioned in your testimony uh, 
concern about flexibility and in potentially inhibiting the flexibility of the Office of Administration. Um, and, and I'm kind of curious because what this legislation does is it codifies the executive order from Governor Wolf so that the process and the system that you have in place can continue no matter who the governor is in the future. Now, my understanding is that you have made some changes. Um, you talked about shared services, your enterprise system. Has the governor's executive order been updated to reflect your new enterprise system? I believe it was in 2019. Okay. So, um, and that you believe affords you with the flexibility. So, if the language in this legislation um, that was the uh, based on the original executive order was updated to reflect the changes that were made to the executive order in 2019. You do you believe that you would have the flexibility that you need under this bill to do what you would like to do? I, I would certainly like the opportunity to work with you on that. Very good. Um, So in your testimony, you referenced increased costs associated with regard to the accessibility of Pennsylvania citizens, uh, yet we know that the Treasury under the former state treasurer, uh, as well as the Senate of Pennsylvania have created transparency portals. Um, it is the right thing to do. So how do you believe that? Uh, we can all work together to increase transparency. Um, so the way I understand the bill, it's about transparency for IT projects. If, if I've misread that, please, please correct me. That is correct, yes. Okay. okay. So internally, I can tell you that we have a portfolio and project management system that I do believe provides that level of transparency to internal stakeholders. Let me be more specific. There is a list of active projects that people see internally today. It includes many of the properties in section, I believe it's 4312, that talks about red and green and amber status and some of the key controls that we need in place. I believe that that is functioning as the law would require it to be designed today. The, 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 the challenge is that that is not a public view, which I believe the law intends to be accomplished. That's where some of the cost is, is based. We would want at least the ability to pull cyber projects out of that list before they were published we would need to build a system to provide that level of transparency to the projects. And we would need to support it on an ongoing basis. That drives costs. Well, I think we, we have to balance uh, costs and with the public's right to know. So I think that we're going to have to continue to have that conversation. Certainly, um, we would never want to put out in a public way information that could potentially compromise the security. However, um, creating uh, the opportunity for the public who has that right to know to have that information at hand, I, I think, is, is very essential. I'm going to turn it over to Representative Representative Senator Dush, we started in the House together um, <laughs> uh, for additional questions. Senator Dush. Yes, uh, going back to the personnel side, uh, how is recruiting and retention going for you guys right now because of the, uh, I understand there's some significant bidding wars going on out there for talent and I was wondering how it's affecting you. Um, so what I can say is that Central Pen Pennsylvania is not exactly the IT hotbed of the country. Um, over the last five plus years, I would say that on average, uh, we are probably at about a 90 to 95% filled rate. To say that differently, 
we're at a 5 to 10% vacancy rate. And I'm sure you can figure that out on a basis of around 1,400 IT staff. Mm -hmm. that, that's a lot of people. Um, and one of the things, I was former Chief of Information Protection for the Pennsylvania Air Guard. Uh, going back to the personnel on the access to systems and uh, that sort of thing, the vulnerabilities, is OA involved with, uh, as part of that consolidation that you guys have done, uh, are you involved with any of the training requirements for the personnel who have access to the systems um, and teaching them about the difference between phishing and spear phishing and th those types of things? Terrific question, thank you. Yes, we've had a security awareness training program in place since 2012 and it covers all of the aspects of good behavior around accessing systems, the credentials needed to, to get that. We've worked collaboratively with the budget office on fraud awareness training. Um, and we work collaboratively with counties to share information and sh actually share the same security awareness training based solution. Thank you. We've come a long way. Um, I would like to recognize Senator Brooks virtually for a question. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I had questions on your employee level as well. Uh, can you talk quickly about the expertise that you have more in your programming staff, your systems analysts? Uh, what is their background? Uh, what is their training? Uh, terrific question. I'm, I'm, I'm going to access a document in real time just to help answer that question, so I apologize if I'm not maintaining eye contact. So what we do in our application portfolio is we look at common technology. So you can think of programming languages, databases, middleware, on and on it goes, network requirements, many cyber requirements. So when we look at the common pieces of technology, that's where we want to make sure we're focusing our recruiting. And that's where we want to make sure that we're working with agencies to say, some of these outliers probably represent some risk. I, I hope that makes sense. So when we're looking at our skills, many of our applications were developed internally. And I'm going to say about 75% of those applications were developed in-house with technology that was available at the time. So some of our core skills are in things like, I, I, I don't want to use supplier names, um, but very, very popular web-based development technology. Our favorite language, COBOL, second favorite language in all of those application systems is COBOL. Fun to recruit. But the thing is, you have an opportunity. I mean, there were significant amounts of systems uh, in Pennsylvania across the country that ran on COBOL. Yes. Uh, but they've actually moved in to the future. And uh, so what is your plan to transition that uh, into a newer updated language? Um, so, to, to be clear, um, what I'm trying to describe is sort of the core skills in programming, web development, COBOL, core skills, some databases, I, 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 again, I prefer not to use supplier names, relational databases, hierarchical databases, they're our most popular skills. When we talk about the languages and the databases that are in that uh, portfolio, what I will share with you is that over the last four years, we've seen unique skills, unique products reduce. And the way we do that is we talk about the risk with our agencies. We, we like to use the word legacy and sort of throw a blanket over the, the problem. The problem really isn't legacy. When a system, new business system goes live, 
on the day it goes live, it's legacy. Because now there's a technical debt to service and support that application within that technical environment. And that's our airplane. That's what we have to paint when it's in the sky. Taking it out of service means the passengers that would be on that plane are not being served. That's part of our complication. So to answer your question, Senator, when we look at that portfolio, we don't look at it as an IT portfolio. We look at it as a business application portfolio. And we work collaboratively with the agencies to make sure they understand the risk. You gave me an example of a mainframe. Many of the mainframes that serve Pennsylvanians today are absolutely contemporary. They're current technology. What we're talking about is the skills and the availability in the labor market to support that. That's kind of where the risk is. From my perspective, if it runs on COBOL and runs successfully on COBOL and has current business logic in it on supported platforms, I'm good with that. I hope that answered your question. Uh, not completely, but uh, I'll move on to the next one. Uh, so you mentioned web design. A web design is completely different than a systems analyst or someone that writes your code and, and things. So do you have all of those spectrums uh, in-house systems analysts? And if you do, when, a, when the state enters an IT contract with a third party vendor, who actually views those contracts? Is it actually uh, your data systems, uh, some of that core group, or is it more folks that uh, look at the numbers, or is it folks that are familiar with what the end outcome needs to be? Um, hmm. Lots of questions there. Um, so as part of, uh, I'm gonna to try to focus on the procurement of the service. We work collaboratively with the agency to automate the business process. We work with DGS, we work with council to make sure that the requirements to meet the business need are covered in the procurement. When bids are submitted, we have a range of subject matter experts ranging from networks to security to programming languages and databases to look at those proposals and participate in the solicitation, evaluation, and scoring. To answer your question more directly, we have the skills. We would like to have more. And what do you do to keep those skills updated in the market? What type of training, what type of educational opportunities do you offer uh, to keep those skills updated? We have a training curriculum uh, that we compete competitively and we uh, enable our employees to take the training that, to meet their demands. I hope that answers it. Uh, yeah, it, it answers a little bit, but I, I just can't imagine that your training is adequate to, and that you wouldn't have to go out of house to acquire some of those skills uh, that are newer and those technologies that are newer. Um, I will say that I'm gonna have to disagree with you as far as that we do not have the skill set in Pennsylvania to uh, meet these job demands. Uh, I do think that we uh, have many, many folks that meet these uh, job demands and I'm not quite sure where you're looking for them, but um, I, I, I disagree with you on, on that. I, I do agree that there are bigger markets than central Pennsylvania and that those skills are available in those markets. And have you, have you um, entertained now with folks, you know, working virtually and, and things going into like the Pittsburgh market or, you know, the Philly market or uh, sometimes though, you know, the greatest gems can be found uh, in some of the smallest markets. 
what I will say, Senator, is we recruit, recruit from across the state. Some of our okay. requirements involve on-site presence. Okay. Yeah, all yes. right, that concludes my uh, questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair. But again, I, I, I'm not sure the state has the wherewithal to provide the training. I mean, my gosh, there's multi-million dollar companies that, and billion dollar companies that, um, and worldwide companies that have to go out of house uh, for updated training and, and things like that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Brooks. Um, Mr. McMillan, really quickly, because we need to move on to your, your colleague, Deputy Secretary Hess. Um, with regard to the unemployment compensation IT system upgrades, were you and your department involved in, in those conversations? Yes, ma'am. You were. So uh, at every stage, it was not like the Department of Health where you weren't initially consulted, but you have been involved in every stage. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So um, we have a few other questions that we would like to follow up with of you. Of course. With regard to the, the numbers and the fact that you don't believe that there's any sort of savings from IT consolidation and, and would like to, to flesh that out a little further. But very much appreciate your testimony here today. Um, and we need to move on to our second panel. So I thank you very much, Mr. McMillan. And joining us today for this part of the discussion is Ken Hess, Deputy Secretary, Department of General Services. And um, Mr. Hess, welcome. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, do you swear that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, please affirm by saying yes. Thank you very much. And again, we have written testimony. If you'd like to offer a few brief opening remarks, and then um, we'll turn things over to Chairman Kane uh, for some questions. Thank you. Deputy Secretary has, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Oh. All right, there we go, that. you've got it. Since 2017, DGS has with OA consent resumed responsibility for IT procurement. Together with OA, we've applied the principles of continuous improvement and best practices, best industry practices to deliver significant value in the delivery of IT hardware, software, and services. Uh, to the tune of about $228 million in savings over four years, about 16% of the, acquisi the uh, acquisition cost or prior acquisition cost. And when you factor in our cost of operations in the Bureau of Procurement, that's about a 5.7 uh, times ROI. Uh, the NASPO survey of state practices indicated 28 states with central IT procurement, with four having delegated IT procurement authority, and 16 with shared responsibility. I believe that hybrid model of shared responsibility brings the strengths of both the technical and commercial together to result in a better outcome. And I think we've demonstrated that to this point. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Hess. Chairman Kane. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Deputy Secretary Hess, please provide us with some insight on the IT procurement process okay well uh, it is somewhat <laughs> complicated I'll hit on the high points and try to contrast for you those areas that uh, where we have special provisions uh, regarding IT right as opposed to buying dump trucks for example so normally procurement start with a notice of forthcoming procurement or the recognition of need um, but that's not where IT starts IT starts with a project request form there's an IT B, BUS 001A form that has to be approved uh, prior to a notice of forthcoming procurement arriving at, uh, at the Bureau of Procurement. And I believe that's where John and his team are uh, prioritizing. They are looking at existing solutions. Uh, They're doing the TIPR, the IT investment uh, review process, um, and that they are ensuring that funding is available. So notice of forth forthcoming procurement, we select the solicitation method, uh, there may be a supplier form involved, 
and in, in, in many cases with, with IT, um, there, there's a sort of a branch where uh, because of the, the, the pace of, of development of new technologies and operating systems and software, um, many times there's an RFI that would precede the RFP. So a request for information goes out to bring ourselves up to standard, right, from COBOL times and DOS uh, to uh, uh, avail ourselves of what's, a, what's in the marketplace. Then we go after a solicitation. Um, of course, when you're writing a statement of work, it's a heck of a lot easier to write a statement of work for a dump truck than it is for a, a UCMS, for example, uh, Unemployment Compensation Management System. Uh, and John and his team are responsible for, and I counted them last night, 90 IT policies and 56 supporting documents. They focus on the technology and they bring those SMEs and subject matter experts along with our commercial experts in, in, in procurement to develop a, a, a much, much more effective statement of work, cost matrices, appendices, et cetera. Of course, uh, let's see, we go through Bidisbo goal setting, there's final approval of the solicitation package, advertising, Q&A. So uh, recently um, we went to market for a new lottery system, right, IT, and very, very complex IT. Uh, there were 582 questions submitted by the suppliers. Um, so again, way more than you would get with a dump truck. Um, uh, we uh, then receive uh, the proposals, um, and you know they're, they're highly technical. We're talking thousands of pages, uh, usually, or, or at least hundreds, when it comes to um, some of the more sophisticated systems. Clarifications, right? So. In, in Q&A, that's the vendors asking us. In clarifications, now we have their proposal and we're going back and asking them. Again, much more robust, much more time consuming. Demos, right? we, we might want to see uh, their systems in action. Um, uh, and, and so that is uh, much more prevalent with IT procurement. Uh, so then we score the technical, we look at cost, um, we do a final evaluation. And once we have all the, the, the pieces together, then we do something a little different for IT procurement. We'll look at GSA, Schedule 70, uh, for example. You know, can we, is our piggyback, piggybacking opportunities uh, there or with uh, other uh, uh, cooperative procurement uh, agencies, piggyback on other states, for example. Uh, recommendation for selection of contract negotiations. We conduct those negotiations. And then things get a little more uh, laborious with IT, where liability uh, is concerned and risk management. Uh, those create much more uh, uh, in-depth negotiations. Um, and then there's something a little different on the IT side again, where a shopping cart is required. Now that everything has been crystallized, it's going back over to, to the CIO for his approval. Then we execute the contract. Okay. Why? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and that's a standard process. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman yeah. Kane. And I, I'm going to ask you a similar question mm -hmm. to the one that I asked our, our CIO earlier, and that is, does your office or the Department of General Services routinely have conversations with the Office of Administration regarding IT procurement, and you, meaning DGS, are in theory the experts on procurement for the state. However, OA are the experts in IT. So coordination between your two entities would be incredibly necessary in order to be successful. And uh, what does that look like? Well, so uh, from the overarching governance point of view, when, when John and his team uh, set about writing the rules uh, of the road uh, for IT project management going forward, a portion of that involved the commercial part and the acquisition of the hardware, software, uh, licenses, services. And we helped to write those ITPs and, and the management directives associated. So we got our input in there early. 
That's the overarching umbrella. Then as procurements come to us, um, we don't pass along, we don't approve a notice of forthcoming procurement without his approval, right? That, so it's been vetted up front that yes, this is true need, there is no duplicative uh, layering, you know, split between agencies or something like that. Um, and, and, and in particular in the development of the statement of work and, and in scoring, IT is, is at our side writing those specifications or uh, helping to evaluate, evaluate agency provided specifications uh, to ensure that, that we do maintain the security, the safety, and the uh, and performance uh, and, and minimize risk. So do you have people in your shop at DGS who have particularized IT experience or expertise? And, and the reason I ask is that I believe it's vital that those individuals who are choosing the IT vendors for the state have that specialized knowledge in the field. They're choosing vendors to handle, as you noted, incredibly sensitive information. And I would hope that they have some level of expertise in the office who is choosing them. Sure. Well, uh, I will say this. Um, I think it is a measure of an endorsement of my team's capabilities that John now has six of them. <laughs> um, our folks uh, are going through ITIL training or have their ITIL certification. Uh, so yes, we are very much concerned about the technical aspects of, of, of what we are attempting to acquire. And moreover, as, as greater and greater technology and connectivity go into everyday devices, right, like dump trucks, um, we have to apply some of those very same principles that we would in a UCMS system to uh, a dump truck that has telematics or uh, onboard diagnostics and so on. Um, so, yes. So you mentioned in your testimony that federal grants could be impacted right. Uh, from the passage of this legislation. And, and that was a pretty broad and I think generalized statement. Yeah. So can you speak more specifically uh, about how they'll be impacted? What specific grants you believe will be impacted and how? Okay, well, I am far from a grants expert. Uh, however, I am aware that 2 CFR 200.20 uh, on computing devices, 2 CFR 200.58 on information technology systems, 2 CFR 200.94 on IT supplies, and then there's all sorts of related sections that branch out from those, contain specific requirements regarding procurement, management, ownership, and divestiture of IT equipment um, that are purchased with federal grant funds. Um, 2 CFR 200 is entitled Uniform Administrative uh, Requirements, Cost Principles, and Audit Requirements for Federal Awards. And so that's a big umbrella thing. Then other federal agencies have their own specific requirements in addition to the umbrella requirements of the federal government. So an example of that, 45 CFR 92.36 is the US HHS, so Health and Human Services, specific grant requirements. And so one example I pulled was that there are limits on the use of pre-existing contracts. So if we want to acquire some things that perhaps Uncle John has written some, developed some specifications around, I can't necessarily utilize uh, those contracts or, or, or standards because the feds have something to say about it. And I can't give you specific examples. Um, I, I, I bump into this from time to time. Um, and, and so this was more of a, you know, just shining a light on it. For, don't have for any those specific interested. examples that you can share with us. I, I do um, not at this time. That would be helpful, so yeah. so we could better understand sure. um, exactly how to craft language to assure that challenges mm -hmm. with regard to federal funding are are not um, mm -hmm. brought upon us. Yeah. And and then lastly, just a question regarding uh, procurement generally um, and the minority owned, veteran owned business classification that companies have to meet in order to be awarded a project. So if companies are disqualified because of a technicality, how can we make sure that we have uh, 
the best mm -hmm. entity to make sure that our data and our information of our constituents is safe. Some, you know, I'm hearing from different business entities that mm -hmm. are operating in this sphere. There's some really specific technical requirements that it's hard to find the companies that can provide that service and then with these additional uh, requirements put upon them. H how do you manage all of that? Well, um, first of all, uh, we're talking technical qualification, not qualification as an entitled um, entity, right? That, that they are a valid um, disabled veteran business, right? You, we're talking about strictly the technical side, correct? Well, yeah, so okay. I, I mean, I think what it, most IT projects are highly specialized, sure. have very particular specs, and, and I imagine that there are circumstances where there are not any of these minority or veteran-owned businesses that do that line of work. So how, how do you balance IT, cybersecurity with, with those needs? How, how does that all work? Usually, uh, we have all those appendices attached to our, our solicitation that, that lay out all of John's requirements. Um, so it's transparent and, and so that the, both the prime and the sub uh, understand what they're getting into. And so I think that in, in the uh, cases of IT, it's much more common for there to be a, a prime of some size and depth and financial stability that then subcontracts to small um, uh, uh, businesses, uh, minority owned, et cetera, uh, that have what, what we'll call niche skills, uh, for example. Um, and so, you know, part of the, um, the evaluation is to ensure that the prime has done a good job in selecting the sub and that the sub's credentials match up with uh, the intended scope of work that the, the prime is going to split off to them. Well, I would imagine that can be with some of the really yeah. specialized yeah. technical mm -hmm. uh, procurements that you do in IT and cybersecurity and other technology related procurements, I'm sure that's a great challenge and, um, you know, ap appreciate mm -hmm. um, understanding a little better how you go about doing that. Um, and Senator Dush, mm -hmm. we're good. Right. Senator Brooks? I believe she's no. as well. I'm good. You're good? I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Brooks. Well, I would like to thank you, Ms. Mr. Hess, um, for your testimony here today. Appreciate everyone who joined us and uh, would like to now recess the Senate Communications and Technology Committee until the call of the chair. Thank you very much.